He's here? Coming up next? I don't believe it. Dan Clark is here, the international speaker. You know, in life, how many times do we set out to do one thing and it never turns out exactly like we thought it would? Achievers North America, Achievers Europe, both of them named Dan Clark one of the top 10 speakers in the world. My dreams of playing professional football are on the cusp. I am so close. He's a New York Times best-selling author. Projected as a number one draft pick, you know, confirmation letter from the Oakland Raiders. He's a singer, an athlete, a songwriter, a philanthropist, a screenwriter, an adventurer. He's everything. High hopes, mighty dreams, and one day in practice, the dream ended. Lyle's helmet hit my neck and my right shoulder and we fell to the ground. My right side went completely numb, paralyzed. My right side of my arm dangled helplessly at my side. Dan's speaking career began when he fought his way back from a paralyzing injury that cut short his football career. In retrospect, it was one of the worst nights of my entire life. My shoulder's still totally numb, the nerves never grew back. Couldn't play football, baseball anymore. Forced me to find myself. One moment in time changes everything. No matter what our past has been, we have a spotless future. So my story is based on that things happen for a reason, but it's our responsibility to determine what that reason is. It's like the guy who has three PhDs, one in philosophy, one in psychology, one in sociology. He doesn't have a job, but at least he can explain why. We never know what's going to happen. Dan is a primary contributing author to the Chicken Soup for the Soul series and author of 20 of his own books. So I saw myself as a failure. I confused who I was with what I did. In 2005, Dan was inducted into the National Speakers Hall of Fame. There's a giant difference between being depressed and being disappointed. Dan has flown in fighter jets twice the speed of sound, raced automobiles in Germany. And I finally figured out that I had something to offer, that I had a reason to live. Carried the Olympic torch in the 2002 Winter Games and has spoken to over 4,000 audiences, totaling more than three and a half million people, and to our combat troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. God bless America, God bless the world, and you have a wonderful, wonderful day. It's kind of odd to me that we would expect an 18, 19 year old graduate from high school to be able to tell us what they're going to do for the rest of their lives by saying, what are you going to major in in college? What are you going to do? What are your plans? That's an unfair question. But I was sucked in. And I just thought I was going to play professional football and baseball. I was going to take my LSAT, go to law school, uh, make a gajillion dollars, be an NFL superstar marry the woman of my dreams, buy the house with the white fence, two kids and a dog, ride my motorcycle cross country every once in a while and live the, the charmed life and it didn't happen that way for me. We had a tackling drill, coach blew the whistle, two of us ran into each other full speed. For just a second, my eye drooped and I had loss of speech, but my right side stayed paralyzed, my arm dangled helplessly at my side. I talked to and it wouldn't move, it scared me to death. With a level two concussion, I threw up, cried myself to sleep, shook all night long, sweated like a pig, and the best description I can give it was when you hit your crazy bone and that's like an amalgamation of the stinging, tingling sensation and the numbness that I felt from the top of my head all the way down to the bottom of my foot. It wasn't just a physical injury, it affected my whole entire life. I couldn't write anymore, I was right-handed, I couldn't think and concentrate on doing any work or homework, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't focus. I went to 16 of the very best doctors in North America. Every one of them told me I would never get any better. Now in retrospect, having been paralyzed for a year, having my heart broken, my dream shattered, I realized some fundamental principles about getting up and going again that are, that are at the heart and soul of success in any field and any endeavor. I thought football was who I was as a man when in reality it's just what I did. And so in that confusion, I thought I was depressed. We don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. If two people are looking out the same window and it's snowing and one says, what a horrible day, and the other one says, let's go snowboarding, the weather did not change. So at some point in our lives, we have to examine ourselves, look at ourselves in the mirror, and not just answer what happened, but we have to figure out why it happened and what we did about it. Then it's not what happens to us, it's what we do with what happens to us that matters. And wouldn't you know it, I had to learn that in a very long, drawn out, sad, startling way. I stayed paralyzed for a year because I was asking the wrong questions. I was asking the doctors how to get better when I should have been asking myself, why should I get better? We have to focus in on why. And do you know what happened is I started asking the better questions and getting better answers. And a friend brings me by a cassette tape to listen to by a quote, motivational speaker by the name of Zig Ziglar. And so when I'm rock bottom, 
I needed somebody to come into my life and remind me you can't quit, it's a league rule. I needed somebody to help me understand why I should fight through the pain. And wouldn't you know it, I'm invited to speak to a high school football team. I drive up to a little teeny tiny town called Morgan, Utah to speak to their high school football team. And as I park my car and drive around and come around the corner, I've been teary-eyed driving the 45, 50, 60 minutes up the canyon feeling sorry for myself. I'll never play football again. I am devastated. I'm decimated. I am so down. Zig Ziglar's tape has fired me up. It's given me hope. What do I do now? And I go to talk to this football team. And wouldn't you know it, their coach comes around the corner driving a golf cart makeshift wheelchair thing. He's got multiple sclerosis. He's legally blind. And in one moment in time, he snapped me out of my doldrums and suddenly I didn't feel sorry for myself. In order for us to understand what I really want to talk about today, let's uh, address a, a common word that we're all familiar with, change. And wouldn't you know it, because of that experience, that high school principal asked me to come into the high school and speak to an entire student body. And we put together this little slideshow and I wrote the script and I got these slides put together and I hired my little brother to show up and do this deal. We put on a 45 minute assembly and we dazzled the schools. And principal of Morgan calls five of his principal friends that year and says, you gotta have this school assembly. It was awesome. How much did you charge? I said, I don't know, I have 50 bucks. Next year, we had the phone ring and we had 13 schools and we wanted to take it statewide. I contacted a gentleman by the name of Doug Miller. Wouldn't you know, Doug Miller so impressed by our idea and my, and my passion to, to take this program to the state that he sets up an appointment and I present to the Utah State Office of Education, Utah State Legislature. They unanimously, unanimously decide to fund me to speak to every single high school and junior high in the state of Utah in 1982. And it went so well, they decided that they would fund it the next year, so I went back to back, 82 and 83. And it was funded by Free Enterprise Education. We need to take free enterprise education into the schools. So, the entrepreneur that I am, I'm like, wait a second. I can talk about scarcity. I can talk about opportunity cost. I can talk about sunk cost. I can talk about economics 101, marketing 101, and still tell my stories. Because now, I have already started to recover. Because my audiences are always so sophisticated, obviously they've heard most of the great speakers on the planet which means that I've got to be special. I've got to make sure my, my message is always cutting edge and fresh. So I'm always in search of the new high adventure. In fact, one of the coolest things I've ever done is I had a chance to go up to the edge of space on October 23rd, 2010. In a U-2 spy plane, the altitude must remain classified, obviously, but let's just say I was well above 70,000 feet where I could see the curvature of the Earth. I love to quote Max Lucado, who said, we must be willing to pay any price and travel any distance to associate with extraordinary human beings. I'm always searching for that, that interview with the super successful. And consequently, I've been invited as a house guest into Muhammad Ali's home. Done stuff with Michael Jordan, played golf with Tim Tebow. And as a songwriter, I've really had an opportunity to be tutored and mentored by some of the greats, Willie Nelson and Alice Cooper. I've had a chance to interview Michael Phelps and Emmett Smith and the list goes on and on. Making sure that I understand from their perspective what it really takes to be a peak performer. In fact, one of the greatest honors I've ever had is I was invited to be one of the keynote speakers slash moderators of the Festival of Thinkers as a special guest of Sheikh Nahyan of Abu Dhabi United Arab Emirates. I love interviewing these incredible thinkers, these these game changers and passing that information on to my audiences to share all of the experiences and all the wisdom and knowledge that I have an opportunity to garner as I travel the world and pursue these high adventures. And so far, I think my audiences actually enjoy that, thrive on it, and get fired up because of it. So how do you deal with that? Well, let's talk about change. Because before we can get anyone else to change, we better figure out how to do it on our own world, don't you think? So with the impetus of the Zig Ziglar tape, the opportunity to speak at Morgan High School and stop feeling sorry for myself because here's this amazing human being who's a phenomenal coach and a great, well-respected community activist, community leader, Jan Smith, reminded me that I didn't have it so bad after all. I locked my door with the idea in mind that I wasn't gonna come out of my room until I got my hand above my head. When I started the struggling process, I got my hand about that high, propped it up with some pillows to rest so I wouldn't have to raise it that high again. Smart cookie. I continued on. I 
I struggled, got it that high, propped it up again. I continued on, I had shoes, books, clocks, you name it. Seven hours later, my, my hand was above my head, I did it. Next day, it only took me five hours, so I was making progress. And over the course of six months, I could actually go like this 10 times. It took me a year to recover. And in that process, I came up with a message that I thought was worth sharing to high school students. And I ended up speaking at 170 schools in Utah, back to back. And Zig Ziglar finds out about it. The motivational guru. He came into town to do one of those motivational rallies. And I positioned myself so that I could be backstage when he finished. And I said, Zig, my name's Dan Clark. I was paralyzed for a year. I listened to one of your tapes. You touched my life. I'm alive today because of you. I want to take you to dinner. You're my hero. He says, I'm coming back in three weeks. Call Lori in my office and make an appointment. I hounded her. She finally calls me back. Zig has agreed to let you pick him up at the airport and take him to Hotel Utah. That's a 15 minute drive if I get lost. So what do I do? I go down to Hotel Utah. I rent the little miniature ballroom and I set up my slideshow and I got the little tape recorder and I got the two projectors. And from the time we got his luggage to the time we parked at Hotel Utah, when we walked in the door, he, he said, is there any place I could see this program? I said, yeah, I got it all set up in this little miniature ballroom. He laughed, he thought that was so amusing that I had that much confidence that I could persuade him in 15 minutes. He came in, it was me, mano on mano, Zig Ziglar me, and I gave my entire speech and showed him the entire slides, 45 minutes. And Zig Ziglar in this ballroom stands up and gives me a standing ovation and said, that's awesome and he flies me to Dallas the next week to speak to his company. The next week he sponsors me in the National Speakers Association and has me meet him in Chicago for six days for the NSA convention. A couple of weeks after that, he invites uh, my wife and I down to Dallas, Texas to participate in his Born to Win seminar. And there he introduced me to Jim Kinniger. He took me under his wing. And he said, Dan, I'm gonna book you in a speech in Atlanta, Georgia to educators, about 2,000 educators. If you do well, I'll book you into 14 national student organizations at their national convention this year. Thank God it went well, standing in ovation, and afterwards, Kinniger comes backstage, he goes, yeah, you're it, you're the real deal. In that one year, that one summer, and into the fall, I spoke in 14 of the 16 national student organization conventions, and the only reason why I didn't do the other two is because President Reagan was their keynote speaker. And from there, each of those associations had 50 state associations each state had one. And my career was up and running, and we created my own summer leadership camps. And for an average of 160 school days a year between 1983 and 1989, by modern math, in the 80s, I spoke to over 6 million teenagers. When I made the transition into the corporate arena, it was a whole different deal for me. Speaking in the corporate arena, I was speaking 250, times a year, when most speakers were speaking like 60. And it just kind of took off and parlayed itself. Suddenly someone would come up and say, how can I get a copy of that poem? I want to put it up in my math class. How can I get a copy of that story? That was a great story. I said, huh, oh, maybe I ought to write a book. And to recall those days where I wrote a book every 18 months, you know, started writing songs, wrote, recorded a lot of music, and I would always conclude my speech with a tune, and got into being a songwriter, started going to Nashville, you know, primary contributing author to the Chicken Soup for the Soul series for so long, and now I'm still a primary contributing author. I've written 23 of my own books now, and kind of the rest is history. So, I guess my message is that it's all about believing that it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you that matters and then realizing that the rest just kind of takes care of itself. Mm -hmm.